Hello and welcome to Short Briefings on Long-Term Thinking. Thanks for joining us. I'm Malcolm Borthwick, Editor of Intellectual Capital at Bailey Gifford. In 1996, there were over 8,000 companies listed on US stock markets. 20 years later, that number had almost halved. So more companies are choosing to stay private and for longer. Bailey Gifford has over $10 billion of assets invested in private companies and a further $40 billion in public companies that we first invested in when they were private. Most of Bailey Gifford's private company investments are held in investment trusts. These include SpaceX, the advanced rockets and spacecraft firm founded by Elon Musk, Epic Games, which is behind the hit video game Fortnite, and ByteDance, owners of TikTok, which was the most downloaded app in 2021. It was also the most downloaded app in 2020. To discuss why companies are staying private for longer, I'm joined by Peter Singlehurst, who is head of Bailey Gifford's private companies team. But before we start the conversation, some important information. Please remember that as with all investments, your capital is at risk and your income is not guaranteed. And the risk of investing in private companies could be higher as these assets may be more difficult to buy and sell, so changes in their prices may be greater. And we're recording this podcast during COVID-19, so Peter and I are both at home as opposed to in the usual Edinburgh studio. Peter, welcome to Short Briefings on Long-Term Thinking. Thanks for joining us. So why are companies staying private for longer? So I think there are a few different factors at play here. There are some very hard and tangible factors, um, particularly regulation. Um, Over the last 20 years or so, there have been regulatory changes which have at the same time made it more burdensome to be public, but also made it easier for companies to stay private. In addition to the availability of capital in in the mid and later stages of the high growth private markets, I would sort of categorize those as the hard factors which are pushing companies to stay private for longer. But I actually don't think those are the most significant factors. I think that the more significant and perhaps less appreciated factors come down to the the cultural perception of founders of the value of staying private uh, versus going public. I, I, I think that what founders today increasingly realize is that by staying private longer, they derive focus and from focus, they get competitive advantage, everything else being equal, they are able to build better businesses by staying private longer. And the reason for that is that they don't have to worry about having 1000s of public market shareholders who may well be owning shares for reasons that are completely misaligned with what the founders are trying to achieve, they can maintain a small, concentrated aligned group of shareholders, focus on the operations of what they are doing and the long term vision. And we think, as a result, build better businesses with higher probabilities of success. And I think that this sort of softer factor is, in fact, the most important reason as to why companies are choosing to stay private longer. Are you seeing this change as something which is cyclical or is it a long term trend? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think we had this question ourselves, you know, back in 2012, 13, 14, it- I think it was at that point an open question as to whether this was a a, a cyclical change or structural. I I think that it's become increasingly clear to us that this is a structural change, which which has happened. We we are not going back to the world of the best high growth private companies choosing to go public uh, with a market cap of a few hundred million dollars. Companies will today continue to say private in many cases, for as long as they can. And you know, going back to the, the, the previous question, I think that many of those reasons are, are structural. And how did it all start? Because Bailey Gifford has been investing in private companies for some time now. Yeah, so I mean, it all started with um, an investment that we made in Alibaba in 2012. We, we made that investment from within uh, the Scottish Mortgage Investment Trust, you know, uh, a, a client of ours for the last 112, 113 years. We made a few more investments over the course of 2013, 14. And I think at that 
time, we didn't yet know whether these were going to be a series of sort of one-off investments, kind of almost anomalies of businesses that were staying private longer, or whether this was the start of something that was going to be a more profound change in the way in which companies were capitalizing themselves. But I think what we learned over the rest of the last decade was that, in fact, that was uh, the start of 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 this big change of, of companies staying private longer. And I think that we were um, in many ways fortunate to get off to a, a good start um, in uh, through the investment in Alibaba. And that was you know the, the start of what has gone on to become you know, a, a meaningful area of um, investment for our clients, but also a very important way in which we start to get to know the next generation of companies that are increasingly forming the backbone of many of our public market mandates as well. At what stage does a private company, from your perspective, become interesting or scalable to invest in? So so there are two criteria that we use here. Um, And we try to think about it philosophically rather than quantitatively. So so the two questions we ask ourselves are, firstly, do we have the analytical skill set to be able to tell whether or not this is a good business? And I think that you can sort of perhaps elucidate that by thinking about extremes. So if you think about a very early stage business where a couple of people with a a dog working on something in a garage, um, we don't have the skill set to be able to tell whether or not that's going to be a good investment. Now, good early, earlier stage venture capital investors do, and that's what they specialize in. Um, and, you know, and we need those early stage investors to be mentoring those businesses at those very early stages of development. So that's too early for us. But if you can start to have a meaningful conversation about a company's business model, about the management's team, management team's track record in executing, if you can... Uh, talk about a business's competitive advantage and the the scale of their uh, addressable market, well, then the, these are the factors that we've been analyzing for 100 years as an organization. And so we think we do have the, the analytical skill set to be able to determine whether businesses that are beginning to exhibit those characteristics can be good investments for our clients. So that's the first criteria. The, the second criteria you know, in many ways sort of turns the question back on ourselves and says, are we the right partner for this company at the given at the given stage of development that it is at? So again, thinking about those those different stages, very early stage companies need lots of help and guidance and operational support from from their early stage investors. Um, we we can't and we don't and we don't aspire to be able to do that. Uh, but what we can do is help uh, steward companies um, in the mid and later stages. We can help them make that transition to the public markets and we can provide that continuity of capital at a period of time when much of their cap table will be looking for an exit. And if a company needs those things from their investors, well, then maybe it tells us that we can be the right partner for the right company at the right stage um, of its development. And there's a perception amongst many investors that private companies are more risky to invest in. Is that fair? I I don't think there's anything about a company being private per se that makes them more or less risky. Um. Yes, arguably, if you're talking about a very early stage business that has an unproven product, those companies probably are more risky. Um, but the stage that we're investing at, you know, where you have companies that are normally generating substantial revenues, many of the companies we invest in today are profitable, um, that are growing very quickly, that have got proven product market fit. I don't think there is anything that is uh, more risky about those companies than many public businesses. Um, and I think that you can see that in our our, um, our returns profiles over the years, not just in the upside, but also in the downside. So we've made, we've made over um, about 100 investments over the course of the last 10 years. Um, and we've, we have had one bankruptcy within our portfolio over that period of time. 
uh, you know, you compare that to typical loss rates within earlier stage venture funds where you can be looking at anything from, you know, 20 to 30% loss rates. You know, frankly, when we first started off on this journey, I think we thought we were going to have higher loss rates than we have done. So do you think too much has made it a difference between private and public companies? And at the end of the day, you're just looking for great long-term opportunities? Yeah, I think that's ex- exactly right. Um I think that it's to the detriment of companies, it's to the detriment of end asset owners that the financial world pretends that there is a meaningful difference between private and public companies. Um, I really don't believe that there are meaningful differences. There are differences in terms of how you source businesses. There are differences in terms of the relationships that you can have with companies, which are often much closer uh, when companies are private. But I don't think there's any difference in terms of the qualities of companies and the ability to create returns for your clients. And so the the sort of the journey that we've been on for the last 10 years has been about trying to break down this artificial divide between private and public companies, because we believe that that is in the interest of our clients. And we think that it's in the interest of the companies that we're backing as well. And most of our private company investments are in investment trusts. Why is the closed-ended vehicle more attractive than the open-ended vehicle in this situation? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, the, the long-term capital within investment trusts is, is attractive to us, but it's also really attractive to the companies that we back. It's attractive to us because it means that you can really practice this long-term uh, investment philosophy and where you find a business that can compound over you know, 20 years, you can just continue to own those businesses over that period of time. But for the founders that we back, it means that they, they know that provided they're executing and providing the growth and the upside remains, they will have a partner within Bailey Gifford that can stay the course because of the longevity of the capital in these investment trusts that we, that we manage on behalf of our clients. So what's the problem with investing in private companies if you're an investment manager of a NOIC or an open-ended fund? So there are some regulatory reasons that make it very difficult to invest in private companies from open-ended structures. And, you know, in many ways, I think that those regulations are are right. You're, you are mixing, um, you're, you're investing in a, a highly liquid asset class when you invest in um in a private company and you need to have a structure that is appropriate for that but you also need to have an audience that really understands that um wakes are open-ended structures and so you have this mismatch between the liquidity of the instrument that you own which is completely a liquid um and the open-ended nature of the vehicle which is open-ended and, and liquid and i think that mixing those two um just it's, it's not appropriate, which is why you know, we've you know, always used investment trust structures um, and other structures that that are suitable for the realities of um, of the liquidity of private companies. So the problem can be within a, an open ended fund is that you become a, a forced seller, but you can't always sell because of the liquidity. Yeah, I think that's broadly right, but it works the other way as well because uh, you can't. Build the positions. If you if your if your open ended fund grows, uh, you can deploy fresh capital equally across the, um, the the public assets, but you can't readily just deploy into the the private companies. You can only invest in private companies you know, when they're raising capital, or if there happens to be some secondary liquidi- liquidity. And so the the process of bringing new capital into an open ended fund where you have private companies is dilutive um and if the if the uh the client base of the oic doesn't understand that um well then that's not in the interest of the existing clients because you're diluting their holdings within um uh of of, of those private holdings And something that we haven't discussed so far, it's a, it's a conical 
Mountain in Perth and Kinross, and also a fund that invests in private companies. Where does Shahalian fit into things, Peter? So Shahalian was the first dedicated fund that we launched for investing in private companies. Uh, we, we went down the route of, of using a, an evergreen structure again. Um, uh, and you know, that was that was very important to us when we launched Shahalian, that it would be not only long term, but that it would also be low cost. So the fees for Shahalian are much, much lower than your traditional uh, fund for investing in these sorts of companies. Uh, we, we launched that fund in 2019 and we did um, an additional capital raise within the fund um, uh, last year, uh, sort of springtime last year. And you know, that's a, a portfolio that's you know pretty substantially deployed now, the Shahalian Fund in aggregate. Um, and we've started to see some of our holdings enter the public markets and you know, many of those companies we, we remain shareholders in. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, a public company in its own right. It's listed on the specialist fund segment of the of the London Stock Exchange, um, and uh, and yeah, that was the the first dedicated fund that we that we launched for private companies. And who's it mainly targeted at? So the, the Shahalian Fund initially, we we only marketed it to our existing long standing institutional investors. Uh, we went a little bit uh, broader when we did the C share raise um, uh, to many uh, UK financial intermediaries, um, but it's by virtue of being listed on the specialist fund segment of the London Stock Exchange. You know, it's it's uh, it's a vehicle that's for institutional investors um, who really understand uh, the you know the the dynamics of investing in in private companies. And as I was saying, also Conical Mountain in Perth and Kinross, have you climbed it? Shamefully, I <laughs> haven't actually, which is terrible, isn't it? Um, we maybe we, a New Year's we, resolution. Well, I, had it not been for COVID, we would have had a, a team trip to to go and climb it. But um, hopefully, on the other side of COVID, if there is if there ever is the other side of COVID, uh, we'll get a team trip to go and uh, go and summit it. And. Speaking of the pandemic, what has the pandemic changed your mind about, Peter? I'll talk about two things, if that's okay. One sort of internal and one external. I think the internal one is just the the effectiveness um, of remote working. Um, I think that's something that I had you know, a very different view going into the pandemic than I do now. Um, as a team, we've been able to work incredibly productively and efficiently um, over the course of the last two years. But I think that's largely because we had you know, very good you know, social and personal bonds within the team. And we had a very you know, aligned view of what we were trying to do as a team. So I guess probably that's the, that's the internal one. The, the external one, and I guess sort of around companies and investing would be around healthcare. And I wouldn't say this is so much uh, a change of mind, more a confirmation of the hypothesis that we had for many years, but I think that the pandemic has, has really proven. Over the last few years, you know, we've been talking internally about the changes in healthcare and how some of the, the developments in the understanding of biology and new therapeutic modalities is leading biology to become much more predictable, programmable. mRNA and vaccines are, I guess, the poster child of that development. But if you look at other companies that we've invested in privately over the years and that are today public businesses like Veer Biotechnology, um, you know, they've had incredible success developing therapies, um, uh, antibody therapies against COVID as well. Um, so I I think that a confirmation around that hypothesis that biology is becoming more predictable, more programmable, and that perhaps in the future, the probabilities of success in developing new therapies, not just against infectious diseases, but more broadly, is is going to go up. And I think that could lead to some very attractive um, opportunities for, for our clients. Peter, progress in healthcare, that's an optimistic note to end on. Thanks very much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you, Malcolm. 
and thanks for investing your time in short briefings on long-term thinking. You can find our podcast at bailygifford.com forward slash podcasts or subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify or on TuneIn. And do check out previous conversations we've had on the podcast, such as how the messenger RNA vaccine is transforming biotech, something that Peter was talking about earlier in this podcast, why investing in some ESG funds could do more harm than good. Have you ever wondered why we are so pessimistic about progress? We'll find out by listening to our back catalogue. And if you're listening at home, listening in the car, wherever you're listening, stay well. And we look forward to bringing you more insights in our next podcast. (music) 